so uh hello and and um welcome thank you so much for putting uh putting yourselves here bringing yourselves um right in the middle of, middle of a saturday to be with me i didn't know what to expect in terms of how many people would come but i'm really moved and excited that there are 30 participants right now um, and still more people joining. My name is Anastasia Higginbotham, and I'm an author, an activist, an artist, and my connection to the Pittsburgh Racial Justice Summit is um, three, three things. One is Yvette Shipman, who is one of your, um, the, uh, an integral force within organizing this space for all of us and all its various parts. Um, I, met, um, I met her at a workshop in New York with, Re with Reverend Angel and um, a radical Dharma workshop with Reverend Angel. So my connection is Yvette and also um, Reverend Angel who, who actually I have known since we were, um, we met when we were both 22. Well, when I was 22, she was probably 23. Um, in New York City in 1993. And um, I have been fortunate to stay in contact and to observe um, the unfolding and emerging and expanding of her um, presence and voice and being. And it has been a huge influence um, in this particular book, in all of my work, but um, specifically in this book. And you see Reverend Angel acknowledged at the very last page of the book as well, for having taught me that love is space. And this book is about love and there's a lot of space in it for that to happen. Um, and my other connection is that I grew up in Washington, Pennsylvania. So I spent the first 17 years of my life in Washington, PA and Southwestern PA. And so Pittsburgh is where my family is. Um, many of my family members in Waynesburg and um, Bridgeville. And so it's nice to be connected geographically to you. Um, so here's what I wanna do. I, I have written four books. These are them, Divorce is the Worst. Tell me about sex, Grandma. Not My Idea, a book about whiteness. And Death is Stupid. And uh, those are my first four books. This new one that I'm gonna read to you right now is called What You Don't Know. There it is. A Story of Liberated Childhood. And um, when I decided to write this book, I knew that I wanted to sh uh, surround a child who, a young child who knows their, already knows they're queer. And um, I wanted to surround that child with people who could really see the child and support the child and encircle them with love and uh, connection and attunement to, to everything that is emerging for the child and the child just as they are becoming. And people who are especially good at staying out of the way of that. And um, I was inspired to, to, to create this character who knew they're gay from a young age by my brother who who had that experience when we were little, but um, in Washington, PA, there was no way for him to have that knowledge and be safe, even inside his own body, inside his own mind, even inside a family that loved him. Um, it was the 80s and the environment was so incredibly hostile. And um, not that it isn't hostile now, but it is different. And so when I sat down to write the book, I knew I wanted to surround the child with these people who could really see them, people at school, people at home and, um, and a good friend so that they're not alone. And yet, you know, what is it? What is it to, to be that child? And I started with that idea and then looking at a blank piece of paper, I asked the child character all right, what do you want me to know? And um, so what, what came through was an entirely different book than I thought I was writing. And uh, so I'm just gonna read it to you now and we can um, have some time at the end for you to share what you think makes a liberated childhood. I put into this book what I think 
uh, contributes to liberation in childhood and um, would love to hear your input on it too. Um, how do I want to do this? I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to read you a story, okay? 1255. Uh, I might glide through the first part of it kind of quick. And then there's a 10 minute section that I really want to um, cover. So we have the time we have. So I, I don't mean to rush us, but I will need to be disciplined with myself. Make sense? Okay. Um, I have to put that away. Okay. What you don't know, a story of liberated childhood. How do I do this? Oh, for Abraham, that's my brother. I began with Billy Porter. This Billy Porter is drawn by an artist who is a recent graduate from high school, the Churchill School in New York City. I don't need tolerance. I don't need acceptance. What we demand is your respect for our humanity. What you don't know is that life was great before kindergarten. I invented stories and characters that thrilled my mother. I painted my face. I danced. It was fun and I was free. Then school happened. Forgive me for rushing. I'll slow down later. School is scary. And we see an older child now who's been in school for a while, hearing the, the slurs coming at them from off the page. Nice flower jacket. F word. Scared people are not the most generous or kind. Did I say scared? I mean scarred. I mean both. And now we see a child remembering being a young, you know, kindergartner, first grader. And the teacher correcting them and humiliating them. Stop flouncing around and giggling with the girls, Demetrius. I'm putting you on the red. And you see the names on the red. Demetrius, Soleil, Lionel, Jalen. We see the names on the green. Green is for good behavior. Finn, Sophie, Rachel. Now that I'm in middle school, I have to wonder, what are we even learning here besides all the things we have to be afraid of, all the things we can't do? And now we see the thoughts of the people at the school, a fellow classmate, I can't fail these tests. The security guard, I can't fail to protect these kids. Is anyone safe to be genuine, to be whole, to be real? And the teacher, I can't pay my bills. Thank God I have friends here, guardians, protectors, family in a way. And we see people in this child's school who matter to him. I have an idea for us. Talk to me after school, says his friend Moxie, his friend who's queer like him. Addie, the radical librarian, says, if I don't have what you need, I'll find it. Ms. O, my teacher who loves me, conveys, I see you. Mr. Vasquez, the counselor who's also queer, conveys, I'm here. And yes, that's Bayard Reston and Audre Lorde on the back in, in, in the frames. But even they are a little bit scared. How do I know? I sense it. One of the benefits of being sensitive. They let me know about safe spaces, which means they know I could be in danger. I'm glad we agree on that. We're starting a podcast. We're going to tell our story, says Moxie. Who's we? Us, the ones who are in this together. Who are we telling? Everyone who listens. What you don't know is there are lots of people I have to hide myself from, but my dad is not one of them. He has always seen me true. He gives me space to be who I am. I do the same for him. The air is easy between us. There's enough. He teaches me what his dad taught him. Don't let anybody out there tell you who you are. All you need to be is you. My father loves me completely and you bet I feel it. See you Sunday, says the child to his dad as he goes to join his mom. My mother fights for us. She was a sensitive kid too. The world is so expletive unfair. <laughs> These effing 
perfectly. <laughs> I haven't figured out how to read this yet. <laughs> I really want to cuss. Um, these people brag about endangering the lives of trans kids, says the mom, looking at her phone. She's reading the news on her phone. They don't know blank about Jesus's grace. And we see little hearts coming off the kid as he listens to his mom cuss. She's got her own sense of justice and her own ideas about God. It may sound strange, but when she's cussing at her phone, I feel loved and seen. The news is atrocious. Hide my phone from me. And clutching her copy of Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler. She gives the child her phone to get rid of it. My mom lets me know that I matter and that I'm not the one with the problem. What you don't know is that even though I'm loved at home, the world's ugliness toward gay people lands right on me. They make laws against us, call us evil, try to convert us. And what about the ones who aren't loved at home? What about the kids whose own families reject them? And the mom reading, we can see where she's focused. God is change, shape God. And now the two of them are in church. Mom brings the child to church with her. Catholic Church. Churches can preach all they want about love. The only thing that I feel when I'm here is shame. But the shame isn't mine and it's not coming from God. I have nothing to be ashamed of. My spirit floats free. And we see his little spirit float free. And we see it float up in loop to loop as Jesus Christ arrives from the other side of the page. Jesus, yes, says Jesus, you're here, always and everywhere. Do you know what's happening down there? Yes. Does it hurt your feelings if I don't believe in you? It's my job to believe in you, and I do. So we're cool? Always. Hey, Jesus, hey, what? Are there other gods besides you? And we see the child's delight as they wait for an answer. Divinity is everywhere, in everyone and everything. And we see the animals, and we see the trees, and the changing seasons, and the water, and the ancient goddesses, and the snake, and the, and the meditation, the bodhisattva, and the black Mary. And we also see an exit sign. Are you gonna punish the people of earth who hate me? Asks the child and blame it on you? No, nope. everyone is invited to love and be loved. How about him, says the child. And we see the spirit of Billy Porter appear along with them. And as Billy walks by and waves to them, Jesus says, especially him, love the dress, Billy. And Billy calls out, yours too, baby. And then we see Mitch McConnell. Even Jesus says yes. <laughs> Want to know what I love, Jesus? Always. I love that you and me are Black. And we see the child still remembering their conversation in spirit form with Jesus Christ. As a woman approaches his mother and says, excuse me, I don't mean to be rude, but you need to keep your son awake in church and teach him right from wrong. There's a place for people like that and it's not heaven. And stop dressing him in flowers. He's a boy. What you don't know is homophobia scares the hell out of me. Well, what you just said is very rude. Mind your own business and stay out of ours. And the child asks his mom, tell me again why we still come here? And she says, I like the smell of the incense. I'm so sorry that happened. Maybe someday I'll understand the hurt that causes the fear, that causes the hate, that causes the violence and stupidity. I said, maybe. <laughs> but love, I know all about. Thanks for telling me, says the dad with the handoff after church. That sounds awful. I'm sorry he had to experience that, says the mom, who is white. I am too, 
Are you really going to stop going just like that? Yes. I know how to find God. I don't need a building. Love you, Mom, and thanks. And the child follows his dad home to the house that they share. Your Aunt Viv's coming over. Can Moxie come too? We're recording our podcast. Absolutely, says Dad. This is the last little bit I'll read. And then we see the two children, Moxie and Demetrius, gathering their thoughts, gathering themselves, imagining what they would like to say in their podcast. Before we were called black, white, brown, queer, before the world saw our bodies and decided we were a boy or a girl or dark or light, before we learned about our sensitivities, disabilities, test scores, zip codes, before and beyond our being your child or that child, a child of this nation or that one, a child of one God or many, a child of earth or outer space, we were our own true nature. And now Aunt Viv arrives. The kids are making a podcast in Dee's room, says her brother. Okay. We are born in a constant state of change, imagine the children, and stay changing. Can you stand to stand back and behold us? Let us be all that we are and all that you are not. God, imagine that. When the world is the way it should be, the way it can be, the way it will be because it has to be, in that world, people's imaginations will be bigger. I'm going to stop there. And um, <laughs> it's so funny to not be able to hear anybody. Um, what happens next? Is um, Oh, you know what? Yeah, you can unmute. Um, hold on, there was one more little piece. Nah, forget it. Um, what happens next is that we see that the children have created their podcast and Moxie has posted it. It's up. And they let the people at school know that they'll be celebrating this weekend at the roller rink and to please come. And, um, and the security guard comes and the teacher comes and the counselor comes and Mizo, who loves him, comes and um, and his mom comes and his dad brings him there and his Aunt Viv is there too. And we see the child really, um, both children, Moxie and Demetrius, just really free and um, unbothered. And so I, what I want to put to the group is is just any reactions that you want to offer to the question of what makes a liberated childhood, whether you saw it in this, these pages that I shared or not, but if there's something you'd like to say about what makes a childhood liberated, what makes it even possible. Um, I'm listening and I will change my view so I can see when people put their hand up. And if you wanna just be brave and unmute and speak, I will listen. Wow, I can't see the, oh, there I can. Does anyone have a question or want to offer? Just in. I can offer something, um, just like a reaction um, that I had. I was thinking about um, at the very beginning when you were talking about, uh, like when the kids were in school and there was this line of like we learn what we can't do and what we can't be and like the lines and the borders of our lives mm -hmm. and I was I definitely that really resonated with me and I was thinking um it reminded me a little bit of last night the keynote I think it was Dr. Sai who said like we need to um get that imagination back you know like we need to have more imagination in the ways that we're engaging with each other mm -hmm. and imagine what it would look like to envision liberation for everyone mm -hmm. and um 
yeah, I think when I think about a liberated childhood, I think about that permission to imagine and that permission to um, not have all of those borders on what you can and cannot be. Um, and I think particularly when you start to layer on intersection, intersecting identities, um, it's hard, I think, for kids to understand, you know? And so I think that um, continual permission to imagine is what I really got out of that. And there's so many structures in our lives that prohibit us from doing that. So I think even just a little bit of permission to kind of engage those um, ideas uh, really resonated with me. Permission to imagine, yeah. That struck me too when Reverend Angel said about to white people in particular, go get your imaginations. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I raised my hand. Let me take my video. Let me. Hi, Imani. Hi. <laughs> okay, that was just so beautiful. I wanted to. I needed to breathe so I would not cry. But it was cry. It was tears of joy. Tears of joy. Absolutely. Uh, hugged my heart. Hugged my heart. So, um, and while I'm while I was listening to Susan's response, I'm, I'm mailing, I'm pre-ordering and mailing it to a friend of mine. Wow. Um, Thank you. So yeah, it just, Thank it was you. so beautiful. It touched me in many ways. So my brain was kind of split because um, um, my high school best friend, um, she has a daughter. I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we've been reading her daughter's text. <laughs> so I don't know. It, you know, her daughter doesn't say I'm trans, you know, and she's like an amazing basketball player, but she's, she's, a, she's still a little girl. She's not, she's not even a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't know those words, but they do live in the church. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just thinking her mother reached out to me about this because, uh, you know, yeah, she, she just needed some support mm -hmm. and, um, that book, I think, is a blessing. But I, my other part of me, because I have a son who's born with an extra chromosome, and I did such a good job, I think, in creating this community. Mm -hmm. And I think you've heard this story I, I told, but um, one time he got locked out of the house and he was taken to the police station and he was eight at the time. And most everybody in my neighborhood knows him, um, but there was a caregiver for a senior citizen who did not know him. Hmm. She did let my, my, my other son was in the shower, did not hear him. Um, she took him in and uh, she asked him his name and, and my son did not, you know, say his name. He is verbal, but it, it's on his choice. He did ask her for toast though. So she did give him lots of toast. Mm -hmm. But she called the police and she called DCFS. I don't know what you call it in your area, but, you know, the Child Protective Services. And, you know, they took him to the police station. And um, when, I got, when I got there, uh, they said, have a seat. You've lost custody. And I was frozen, but I was also aware that four policemen had surrounded me. They had surrounded me. They did not draw their guns, but they were in position. And I thought to myself, oh, oh, okay, this is when people lose it. And I was, I was, I was, I was losing it, but you know, inwardly. Mm -hmm. um, and it was my first time. And my girlfriend said this to me when I got home, the world does not see my son the way I see my son. Mm -hmm. I created a community thinking I'm gonna model. I'll model for everyone how, you know, you do this, but it's only within those walls that my son is safe. Right. And I said something to another girlfriend who has three children who are, I, I just say, sometimes I said, why you're differently? That's what, that's what I say. I mean, I don't, I don't know a diagnosis, you know, just wired differently. And um, she said, Imani, I waited eight years for you to say that. Oh. And it was my first time, you know, I never flinched even I didn't maybe at 26 weeks I found out that he had an extra chromosome mm -hmm. I never flinched I was like oh okay here we go we're gonna do this you know yeah. baby number five it can't be that different 
That's what I thought. And so inside of my home, inside of my world, it wasn't. And that book, it just touched me in so many ways. So I just really wanted to say thank you. I don't, I don't want to go on about my story, but it, it just opened me up mm. to that there are just people out there, um, you know, working to bring us into some alignment with ourselves, with love, with mm. all of it was just so beautiful. You know, the African Jesus, all of that, just so beautiful. I just... I don't know. Hugs through the through the uh, computer. <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel that, Imani. And that that way, there's so many things what you said will stay with me. But when you said, "Here we go, we're going to do this," is really what I I I wanted this book to show how often and how many. Like I I wanted to reflect back for people how how often I know. Families are already doing all of this. Teachers are already doing this. Counselors, the librarian, the, the people in your neighborhood, and also in the child's own biological family, chosen family, people are seeing who arrives and everything they bring and saying, okay, we're going to do this. Here we go. We're going to do this. And, and that is something to really be celebrated. And knowing who your people are as a child and being able to go into a school that's hostile, but find those friendly eyes and those friendly eyes and those friendly eyes and people who will really point you in the direction of your own becoming um, and, and behold it is, you know, that is really something to celebrate. And that's why they end up in the roller rink together celebrating because um, that is, that is the, the, that's the minimum that a child needs to be able to expect from their, uh, the people that they're born into and the environments and the spaces that they step into. And so I wanted to imagine that and uh, populate this book with beloved people from my own life who, who embody all of that, those things. So. As the mother of a brown baby, and she is five years old. So she hasn't even begun to explore life. This book just goes to show, it, it was confirmation for me to continue to pour an abundant amount of love and support and confidence, even in her at five years old, um, just to try to build that level of that shield. Mm. Because as a brown baby, she already has an ax against her. And so, um, because I don't know which lane she's, she's going to walk down or what life has in store for her. Um, mm -hmm. This was just encouragement for me as a parent to just continue to pour. And she has such a, she has such a loving personality. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's because that's what she's been feeling. So mm -hmm. she's now mi mirroring what she knows. So um, thank you for this. And I have other family members that I believe this book could be helpful for. Um, I have a, a family member who is transitioning into the pre-teenage years mm -hmm. and their father, it hasn't come out yet. Mm -hmm. What he's identifying as um, is their question? Absolutely. And the parent is having a difficult time digesting it. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the acceptance part, but how to approach it, how mm -hmm. to be supportive, how to be loving, how to be encouraging, um, and, and, and minimizing what may have already been in his mind or his opinion or whatever it is that he may have thought or felt prior to this direct experience that this of his child. So um, I thank you for making this transparent and making this um, available to people. Um, so that was my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, Kia. Am I saying your name right, Kia or Kea? Um, what you say about that, that minimizing what belief may be there. Do you, am I understanding you correctly that in a, a way that she's offering support to that parent is by like, letting those previously held beliefs kind of dissolve in the presence of this magnificent child who's before? Absolutely. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that.
Anastasia, can I put your contact information in the chat? Please do. Please. It's time for us to wrap up, but it, yeah. it looks like people still want to be able to communicate with you. Please, let's do. Here's um. Let me put uh, my Instagram. You can always write me, but put anything there. I don't care. You can always be in touch. And um, the since you know one thing I regret before I started reading I wish I had just gotten since this isn't uh, sometimes I do these readings and there's a lot of kids in the room and um, I this is actually the first time I've read this to uh, an audience um, and I really need to figure out how to do the cursing because <laughs> it looks how it looks on the page but um, I should have just asked your permission to cuss straight out um, since it's not, this isn't a kid's workshop, but thank you for your patience with that, me bumbling through that. Thank you. Um, do people, does, um, should, should we end and, and let people go so you can go to your next things? And no. <laughs> <laughs> can I just say one quick comment? Yes, please. Um, the part about uh, when they were leaving church, the mother and the son, and he says, tell me again why we still come to this church. Uh, that's when my heart broke open because that has been a, my husband and my experience um, for several years. Um, my husband and I are remarried. His son is gay and I have a daughter who's lesbian. Mm -hmm. And we have come together around that and um, have built an alliance together. And we just kept trying to make this work that people will understand that, you know, love will find a way and love come, conquers all, but mm -hmm. people aren't, they don't feel it. And so um, last year during COVID, when the church closed, we left and we started our own congregation that's <laughs> welcoming and affirming and inclusive. Mm -hmm. And we have just, people have just been gravitating to us. This is since November 1st. And um, just when I heard your, when you started reading your book and when you got to that part about the church, I was thinking this would be perfect. I need this book. And what's interesting also is some people that have been in the other church where we come from, the traditional church, they insist on, they come and um, join us every Sunday anyway, like three couples, they come consistently because I think they need something outside of those walls. But anyway, I need to have your book. And I need to have you read it. <laughs> we'll give you a love offering, please. <laughs> I love your comments because I don't think it's for the children. It's for